Nearly 250 years ago, America's founders came together to declare that everyone has unalienable rights. Just what those rights are has been debated ever since. Judy Woodruff looked at those questions and more today in a visit to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Thanks, Amna. I came here to UVA to take part in a program honoring the NewsHour's co-founder and former anchor, the late Jim Lehrer. And while here, I had the chance to speak with a professor who has long been interested in America's polarization, which has only grown sharper in the past few years, including just last week with the Supreme Court and the abortion rights draft. He is political scientist Sid Milkus, whose latest book is what happened to the vital center? Sid Milkus, thank you very much for talking with us. You have studied, you've written so much about democracy, about you've looked really hard at what's held us together and what's driven us apart. Where are we right now? We're fighting over uh, the meaning of, of our rights, the meaning of, of the Constitution. I think what strikes me as, as different about uh, um, the contemporary period of polarization is, it, is our democracy is so uh, unfiltered now, if you will, yeah. that many of the institutions uh, that in the past have constrained our battles as, um, as, uh, as uh, fundamental as they've been um, uh, have been weakened considerably. And I, and I look uh, to the 1960s uh, as an important period that began to weaken um, some of the key institutions that have been critical to building a consensus in American po uh, politics. And you also write about the, the growing importance, the growing power of the executive branch, yeah. the presidency. How, what effect has that had on our democracy? Yeah. For a long time, uh, until, uh, um, until the 1960s, there was some obligation uh, on the part of the president to stand above um, partisanship, to, to mo moderate conflicts. And, as Theodore Roosevelt put it in a, a kind of a beguiling way. The president was supposed to be the steward of the, of the uh, public welfare. The presidents didn't completely live up to that, um, but there was an obligation to at least uh, transcend to a degree partisanship. Uh, and, and I think that has changed in the since the 1960s. We've seen a merger of partisanship and executive power. And I think that's a very combustible combination. And, and uh, I think some people have been tempted to say former President Trump yeah. is the, the zenith yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. your argument is that it, it, this all started before he came along. Yeah, a lot of the issues that, um, that um, former President Trump uh, um, made uh, central to, to our political battles really start uh, in the 1960s and, it, uh, and really have their origin with the conservative reaction to the dramatic social and cultural changes that take place in the 1960s, civil rights being most, the most dramatic right. example of that. And uh, in response to that, a conservative movement has emerged. And uh, they emphasize things like law and order, uh, protecting uh, uh, family right. values, um, uh, uh, protecting um, uh, the right of parents to have some influence on the curriculum. All these issues are, are there in the 60s. Uh, and they, they've kind of filtered through our political system ever since. And I think what happens is President Trump brings them to a head in a way that, uh, that, uh, uh, that had not occurred before his presidency. How, I mean, given where we are and, and the, the corrosive effects on, um, it seems to me, our ability to work together, how far do you think this could go? I mean, some people mm -hmm. have said, well, maybe we'll have another civil war. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really frightening, Judy, that uh, a lot of uh, commentators have referred to this period as the cold civil war in American politics. And the question is, could a cold civil war <laughs> become a hot civil war? And of course, what happened on January 6th was, was a, a, a really serious foreboding uh, uh, of such a possibility. The, the, the foundation of, of self-government in the United States was challenged in a way that hasn't happened before. The, 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 the challenge to the notion that we had a free and fair election when all evidence pointed to the fact that we did, uh, suggests that, um, that we're in a really dangerous place in American politics. I mean, I don't think we're at the place we're gonna be uh, shooting at each other, uh, but I definitely think a, a political system is in dire straits when each side views the other as an, ex ex as an existential threat to American democracy and, and to their understanding of what American life is all about. I was struck in the book that at one point you quote two other scholars saying, I think this is right at the end, you, 
saying few societies in history have managed to mm. be both multiracial mm. yeah. and genuinely democratic. Yeah. That's yeah. something. It, it, it is really something. And, you know, um, it's hard to find <laughs> reason to be optimistic in, in American politics, but I'm less um, oppo uh, opposed to polarization than a lot of my colleagues because I think, um, uh, in a sense, um, democracy, <laughs> What should be understood as democracy takes flight in the 1960s. Uh, before the 1960s, if you look at comparative politics and the way democracy is measured, given the Jim Crow system and the other um, uh, discriminations against uh, people of color, we were not a democracy uh, until the 1960s. And so it, it seems uh, it's not surprising that since um, self-government in America really took flight uh, only 50 years ago, that we're having these struggles over these issues. And I think it's something we have to have. Because what would really make us exceptional if we can find a way to reconcile uh, democracy in a multiracial, multi ethnic uh, society? Given what you said a moment ago, that you're not so discouraged about the polarization, that it's a healthy thing maybe that's yeah. going on, right? Where are we headed? I mean, how do you see this being healed? Uh, in, in, yeah. in coming years. You know, I'm a lot better at explaining diseases than <laughs> coming up uh, with remedies for them. Uh, I, I don't see anything um, immediate that's going to heal us, but in addition uh, to, the, to the fact that we're having a very important conversation, and that may be resolved by things like massive demographic shifts. I mean, if you look at the young, uh, my students, for example, uh, I don't think they're nearly as polarized <laughs> As the, as the rest of the country. I think they look at us with a bit of, uh, of, of, um, um, of um, disdain <laughs> that, that our generation, is, uh, our gener the generations before them are so, are so divided. A lot of these social issues that, we've, uh, that I've talked about, they, they're very comfortable with them. Uh, they're pretty comfortable about having hard uh, conversations. So that's one hope. Generational change, which is, sure. which is the way um, uh, um, American democracy uh, have, uh, has developed uh, throughout our, our, our history. New generations have. Je Jefferson felt this was absolutely essential about American de democracy, that every generation would have the opportunity to define the meaning of the declaration that fit their circumstances. So that's one thing that makes me, um, uh, gives me some optimism. It's a good note to end on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sid Milkus, thank you. Thank you oh, very it's, much. It's, it's been an honor to be with you, Judy. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here at the University of Virginia, where earlier today I took part in a program honoring my late colleague, Jim Lehrer. You can watch my conversation about how we at the NewsHour work to live up to the standards Jim set. That's at pbs.org newshour.